Plants have really distinct requirements because of their sessile nature, and this is both at the um, organism level. So they have to adjust to their environment at their given location. They have no other option, right? If, um, if they're planted in the Midwest and they really prefer to be on the coast of California, too bad, right? As humans, we can, uh, we can all move to California if we wanted to. Um, likewise, to disperse their pollen and their seed, they have to use um, distinct mechanisms. This is also true on the cellular level. I know that Ram talked to you guys about this on Monday, um, but there's no morphogenic cell movement in plants. Those cells are really cemented in place once they're laid down. And so not only are plants as an entire organism sessile, but the cells themselves are also sessile. They're not moving around. Um, and that raises some other interesting um, things like moving molecules around the plant there's no circulatory system, right? Because there's no movement. So all materials have to either move by mass flow, by changes in hydraulic pressure. So for example, um, this is how water gets from the soil up into the upper parts of the plant. It's all through a hydraulic flow. Um, the mass flow is uh, 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 concentration based. And then there's a series of active and passive transporters that can move molecules across cell membranes to um, affect long distance transport of molecules going from cell to cell to cell across the body of the plant. So I think um, really a lot of the biology around how plants grow and develop and respond to their, their environment is really, really driven by the fact that not only are they sessile on an organismal level, but also on a cellular level. Um, and so I saw this Slide from Ram is just a little reminder to you guys from what he talked about earlier this week. Um, so these cells have a cell wall, they're cemented in place, and um, to drive different aspects of plant form, the plane of division for um, increasing the number of cells really drives um, a lot of the plant form. So if you make these paraclinal divisions, you can increase the girth of an organ, whereas if you make these anticlinal divisions, you're going to add more cells to this layer. And you can use a combination of these two types of cell divisions to change the form of, of a, um, an organ. In addition, cell death is rarely used to generate form, unlike in metazoan. So, for example, you wouldn't, as a plant, you wouldn't kill this cell necessarily to allow for um, developmental events because this is surrounded by a cell wall and um, these aren't these surrounding cells aren't going to move to compensate for that. So um, that's also another pretty key difference. Um, another interesting thing about plant cells is that they have flexible fates. So um, most plant cells are totipotent. So are you guys familiar with this term? No. No. So basically, the word the word totipotent means that um, any individual cell within a plant can be uh, used to produce every other type of cell in the plant. So, unlike uh, humans, for example, where there's um, you know, terminal cell fates that you can't return from, there's no such thing in plants. So you can take a 20-year-old cell um, that has been around, it has a certain cell fate, bathe it in the, an appropriate uh, cocktail of hormones, allow it to become completely de-differentiated. This means that it loses all of its specialized characteristics. And then you can bathe it with a different cocktail of plant hormones um, and establish new meristematic tissue and create an entirely new plant from that, right? So um, this would, for example, be like being able to take a skin graft from a human and growing a heart out of it eventually with the right conditions. Um, and so this is actually a feature that's been taken advantage of for um, at least a century 
by horticulturalists to um, propagate new plants. So some of the um, some of the plants that you see that are grown popularly in people's yards, those are all clonal. So there's been no um, sexual reproduction of those. Every single plant you see is literally a clone of some original parental plant. And these have just been sequentially over many decades um, vegetatively propagated. Do you guys have any questions about that? No. <laughs> okay. I can't see you at all. Uh, and I don't know if you're not being talkative because uh, there's not been enough coffee this morning or if you're not understanding me. So um, you guys are going to have to speak up. So I think this is actually really cool, right? Because um, this is a feature that's, that's pretty unique to plants that you can just regenerate an entire new organism from just a cell or two. Um, okay, in addition, um, a huge feature of plants is that they have really extensive post-embryonic development. So um, if you compare that to a human, for example, for both of them, there's a fertilized egg. Then there's some process of embryogenesis that forms the organism that's going to emerge at birth or germination for the plant. And the difference here is that when you were born, you pretty you had every organ that you're ever going to have, right? It's not like you all of a sudden grew a new organ um, sometime in your 20s. Um, conversely, plants are continually developing new organs, and in fact, they have organs at full maturity that they didn't have when they germinated. So, for example, um, flowers. You don't see a, a plant or a seed germinating from a seed already with flowers. And so plants will continue to initiate and develop organs throughout their life, and this really is key for allowing them to adapt to changing conditions as they grow. As you can imagine, if they're sessile, if the conditions are different, like the, the germinating seed or the process during embryogenesis would not be able to predict those conditions that this plant would see over the course of its lifetime. Um, and so it has to, be, uh, it has to be prepared to change things to respond to any possible environmental changes. Um, and so the term for these externally embryonic um, Stem cells are meristems, and all of this is is a group of dividing cells. So these cells grow uh, divide very, very slowly, but um, they're capable of making all the possible differentiated cell types and structures within the plant. Um, and during embryogenesis, really polarity and symmetry is set, and that establishes the initial two meristems, which are this um, a meristem that's held here. In the apex and a meristem that is held here that becomes the root meristem. And so this root meristem gives rise to all of the root mass at the bottom of the plant and this single set of apical meristem tissues gives rise to all of the leaves and all of vegetative tissues of the plant. Okay. In addition, there's a radial pattern established. So um, in the embryo, there's radial symmetry and um, the development of leaves, flowers, stem, secondary roots, all of that is post-embryonically developed. Are you guys still with me? Yes. yes. Any questions? Yeah, when does the plant, the plant stop being embryonic? When does the plant stop being embryonic? So um, all of the embryogenesis takes place prior to seed set and maturation. So you have a, a flower. Um, let me think of a good example. So a good example might be a pea. Okay, so you have a fertilization event, and within um, within the uh, the ovary, there's going to be a set of individual ovules that are connected, right? So when you open a pea, you have all of those little peas in a pod. Each of those peas in the pod was a separate ovule within a single ovary. Okay, so then the fertilization event happens, a pollen um, tube uh, 
fertilizes each of those into like a different pollen tube, fertilizes each of those. And then the whole embryogenesis process takes place. And so whenever you get that pea, um, you know how the pea will split in half? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so those two halves of the pea, those are actually these two parts of the embryo. So these are called like cotyledons. These are going to be the seedling leaves. And those are not only the first two little leaves of the, um, the germinating plant, but these also hold all of the, um, the energy reserves necessary for that plant to grow prior to being able to capture sunlight for photosynthesis. So, you know, you need an energy source to drive growth and, and, um, and peas, it's gonna be a combination of oils and starches that are being used as that energy source that are going to be mobilized to, to fuel that growth necessary to get out from under the soil so that those leaves can then start capturing sunlight. So, so for the pea example, when you have a green pea, like the snap peas you might eat, embryogenesis is not yet complete. So when you eat snap peas, you're eating plant fetuses. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, it's not complete until the process is completed and then eventually that pea will start drying down. Um, and that dry down process is natural. It helps the, that seed, whenever it falls to the ground, to be able to lay there until conditions are, are proper for it to grow again, usually the following year. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And you're probably never going to look at a pea the same again, right? <laughs> um, okay. So, um, so all of this post-embryonic development relies on those meristems. So if you go back to my pea example, you know how when you break open the pea, there are those two halves, but there's also that little nubbin of tissue in, the, in between at the bottom? That's actually the embryonic axis, and that has the root apical meristem, which is down at one tip. It's going to give rise to all the root tissues. And it has, on the other side of that little nebbin, is a shoot apical meristem that's going to rise, give rise to all of these aerial tissues. Um, and so, in addition to having the shoot apical meristem, which will give rise to, to bees, um, at certain points, there'll be these axillary meristems, these little side meristems that get left behind that could be activated at some future date to allow for side branches. Um, so this the system allows for adaptation to changing conditions as they grow, and they really need those first two meristems made during embryogenesis in order to achieve this. So let's get back to my giraffe picture. Um, so I think that the sessile nature of plants um, is really critical in driving and shaping how plant development works because these flexible cell fates and post-embryonic development are really critical for coping with the environment, right? Because if you couldn't do that, if you were just set with the body plan that you started with, there would be no adaptation to changing um, to the world changing around you, the way that you have to do when you're sessile. So um, these plant responses to the environment are varied. Um, so it's really constant. When I say constant, not just you know over the course of a year, but over the course of minutes, hours, days, plants are continually changing to the conditions. So in the morning when it's cooler, plants will have um, one whole set of like maybe their metabolism may be different in the morning versus the afternoon. They're continually adjusting to optimize their growth um, and survival for the environment at that moment in time. And this change uh, involves changes in gene expression. It involves um, changes in the metabolites that they're accumulating at any point in time. It involves changes in their cell biology and their morphology and growth. Um, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on the morphology and growth for the um, 
the rest of this discussion. Um, in addition, plants will alter their shape, their size, the direction of their growth to continually adjust to their environment. I know many of you have probably seen a plant that's growing in a shady area, how the branches growing on the lit side will grow more than the branches growing on the other side, and they'll actually turn to move towards the light. We're going to talk about the mechanism of that in just a moment. Um, so that's an example of a plant altering their shape and direction of growth to adjust to their environment. Um, and these responses to changes are governed by plant growth regulators. So, for example, my lab studies the plant hormone auxin, and that is critical for every aspect of um, changing plant shape and direction of growth to adjust to stimuli. And the developmental plasticity government governed by these um, by this is by differential production and distribution of these hormones. So let's take a moment to step back and think about what constitutes a plant's environment. Um, who in the room has good handwriting? We need a volunteer. <laughs> uh, we need a volunteer to write on the, on the dry erase board. And I can't see if there is one yet because I can't see you guys. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So you guys start naming. What do you think it can be considered to be a part of a plant's environment? Soil. Soil. Okay. So uh, be more specific. What aspect of the soil? Carbon content. Carbon content? Yes. yes. What else? What else does the soil provide? Water. 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 Mm -hmm. Nitrogen. Nitrogen. We can kind of lump all the nutrients together, I think. What else is a part of its environment? Sunlight. Oh. <laughs> Sunlight. 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 Is this all getting written down? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Can you guys think of anything else? Temperature, pressure. Temperature, pressure, great. Predators. Pardon? Predators. Predators, other organisms, yeah. So these organisms can either be predators or they could be what else? The microbiome. The microbiome. Are, so both beneficial and detrimental uh, microbes. All right, let's see. I'm going to go to my list and see how many have we got. So light, you guys got? You guys missed gravity. I'm so disappointed. You, this is supposed to be a nanobiology group. Um, Temperature, both heat and cold, can be sensed. Water, whether there's too little or too much nutrients. Um, salt, other toxic compounds in the soil. And then other organisms as well. So um, since I already have, I don't know how many of you are vegetarian, but since I probably already grossed out some of the vegetarians by calling the peas um, plant fetuses, I'll tell you a quick side story about one thing plants do when they're being attacked by herbivores, such as our giraffe or by ourselves. So plants can sense when they're being chewed on. Um, and in response to being chewed on, plants will actually release volatile signals into the air to tell all of the plants around them that they're being chewed on. So they're actually like telling each other, I'm being chewed on by a, uh, a predator, okay? And then what happens is the surrounding plants then upregulate their production of anti-nutritive compounds to affect, um, to affect whatever it is that's eating them to make themselves less nutritious or less palatable to those. So a great example of this is chewing caterpillars. Um, plants will actually um, will sense that they're being chewed on by a caterpillar, tell the surrounding plants 
that they're being chewed on, the surrounding plants will um, make specific compounds that inhibit the proteinases in the insect gut so that the insect can't get the nutrition out of eating that plant that it would have otherwise. Okay, so the next time you're eating a salad, you know, your salad is actually, that's living plant tissue that you're eating. And as you're chewing your salad, the salad in your mouth is screaming out to the salad left on your plate. <laughs> okay. um, and to be prepared and to start making these compounds to, uh, to try to make themselves less nutritious to you. Wait, I have a question. Um, yes. What kind of signal do they send to the other plants? Like, how do they tell the other plants that they're endangered? So there's two um, major signals that get sent out, and it depends on what it is that um, is attacking the plant. So um, jasmonic acid or methyl jasminate is one such signal, um, which is also kind of interesting because that's a common in, uh, component of some perfumes. So some women, when they're walking around with perfume on, are telling the plants around them that there's attack happening. Um, <laughs> and another one is salicylic acid. Um, so those are the two main ones that are used by plants as volatile signals for uh, insect or pathogen attack. Thank you. How do they sense they're being eaten? How do they, Pardon? Sense, how do they sense they're being eaten? What kind of um, signals are they receiving that they're being chewed on? Is it? Since I'm talking to the mechanobiology group, I probably should have been more prepared for that question. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know if it's, um, I know you can do it manually. So if you macerate the tissue manually, you'll elicit the same response. So it has to be something um, physical that it's responding to, but I don't know the specifics of what aspect of it is, it is what aspect of uh, the chewing that's actually being responded to. Something I could look up there. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, so how, how quick is this response? So how quickly can cells become less nutritious? Like, is the salad I'm eating at the end of my lunch <laughs> way less nutritious than the salad at the beginning of my lunch? It's actually, it's actually amazingly quick. Um, I, I can't put it into a lunchtime timeline. So anyway. um, but certainly... <laughs> Like, I'm going to say within 10 minutes. Um, so if you eat your salad quickly enough, maybe it won't affect you. But if you're taking, if you're a French person and you're taking your time, um, yeah. Thanks. It's pretty quick. All right, so let's focus on a couple of these environmental cues a little bit. So um, light is an environmental cue. And it's not just, plants don't just sense whether light, whether light exists or not. They're actually very, very sophisticated in their ability to respond to light, um, largely because it's so critical for their ability to survive. So they can tell the difference between night and day. Not only that, but they can tell seasonal information. They, know day, they can measure the day length. Um, they can detect the light quality so this allows them to know whether there are neighboring plants nearby and um, avoid shade. So they can tell the difference in uh, the spectrum of light that they're in. They can tell the direction of the light. Um, and this, the quality and the amount of this light is perceived by photoreceptors. So down here in the bottom, I have a movie of a set of plants growing in the light versus a set of plants growing in the dark. And you can see that they're undergoing very different um, growth regimes. So these guys are opening up these um, embryonic leaves to be able to start capturing the light. These guys don't sense that light, so they're continuing to elongate the seedling stem in the hopes to be able to reach the light eventually. And they're not um, spending the energy to open these leaves because they can tell there's no light there to try to open those blades to capture the light. So they're waiting. Um, until they can sense that. Okay, so, so um, the phytochromes are a set of proteins that 
can absorb different wavelengths of light. So they both they absorb both red light and far red light. Um, and phytochromes are photoreversible. So um, if you expose them to red light, they'll go to one form. And if you expose them to far red light, they'll go to the other form. And each form has a different absorption spec um, optimum. Right, and this is important because if you look at the quality of light um, or the spectrum of light at the top of the canopy versus light filtered through the leaves of other plants, it's quite different. And the ratio of this red to far red light, as you can see here, this is a um, far red and red is quite different. <coughs> so the relative proportions of this red and far red light determined by the um, can be determined by the degree of vegetative shading in the canopy. And so basically, in full sunlight, you have more red light than far red light. And in shade, you have more far red light than red light, because the red light gets absorbed by the green leaves above you. Um, so this allows for a plant to be able to tell whether they're under the canopy of another plant, and if they want, and you know, they want to get the best sunlight possible, so they'll change their growth to try to outcompete their neighboring plant. So here's an example. I think I can't tell from this photo. I think they might be tobacco plants. Um, so the guys on the left were grown in a ratio that was enriched for red light compared to far red light. These guys over here on the right have a high amount are grown in a high amount of far red light compared to red light. And these two guys are intermediate. And so it's pretty obvious to see that. The, these plants, although they're genetically identical, have um, different growth depending on the light quality. And it's not just a yes, no type of answer. You can see that it's actually graded to match the ratio um, of this red to far red light. Because as a plant, you know, you don't, you want to have the best sunlight, but you don't want to spend too much energy doing that if you don't have to. So like this guy um, has evolved to know this is pretty much how much I need to elongate my stem for this ratio of far red to red light to get above my neighbors. Whereas this guy's in bad shape, right? There's probably something really tall next to him. And so he knows he has to grow really tall to try to compensate for that. Do you guys have any questions about this? No. Um, in addition to sensing light, plants can sense gravity um, and other directional stimuli, and they will change the direction of their growth towards or away from that stimuli. Um, so this is just an example of two germinating maize seedlings, or maize seeds. So this one on the bottom um, is pointed downward, and this one, I mean, this one to the left is pointed downward, this one on the right is pointed upward. And what you can see is first the root emerges from each of these, and this root is going to grow down towards the gravity vector. And this one does as well, even though the seed is uh, placed in the opposite direction. And then when the shoots emerge, this shoot is going to grow away from the gravity vector as well this one, even though initially it was pointed downward based on how that embryo was positioned inside the seed. seed. So these tropisms, um, for example, this gravitropism is occurring both in shoots and roots. And so a tropism is just directional growth with respect to some um, exogenous signal, either towards or away from that stimulus. So um, some of the main ones that people study are phototropism, which is growth in response to light. Um, this can both be um, positive phototropism, what you might expect with a um, shoot or negative phototropism, as you might expect with a root. Um, gravitropism, growth in response to a gravity stimulus. And then figmatropism. Can any, anyone guess what figmatropism is? No guesses? Temperature. Temperature? That's not correct. <laughs> actually growth in response to touch. So plants can actually sense when they're touched or when they're touching something themselves and alter their growth in response to that. And these tropisms, again, are really 
key for responding to change in the environment if you're a sessile organism. You can see that the whole sessile organism um, problem is a theme that's running throughout our discussion today. Okay, so um, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about phototropism. So here's a bunch of maize seedlings that are um, newly germinated, and there's a light bulb hanging in the middle, and you can see that all of these guys are bending towards the light. Okay, and in a moment, this light bulb is going to go off, and then they're going to stop their phototrophic behavior and um, start growing back upward again, because there's really two competing forces fighting for, um, that the plants are trying to distinguish between. So there's the phototropism, they're growing towards the light, but then there's also gravitropism, where they know that they need to grow upwards, right? So when the light was turned on and the overhead lights were off, then the phototropic drive was really the thing that was dominating their growth. But then once that was no longer a primary driver, then the, um, the gravitropic growth was the thing that was driving it. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. yes. Okay. Is, which is the stronger, is it the photo, is the light the stronger um, driver compared to gravity? Or can you really make that comparison? Um, so I think that that depends on the organ. So definitely in the aerial parts of the plant, um, Phototropism is going to win over gravitropism because that's that's where the plant is going to be getting all of its nutrition, right? So it's not going to grow up if there's no light up. If light is only to the side, it's going to go to the side. So this is why you can sometimes see like a plant that's the seed has landed in like a crack in um, in a sidewalk or in the side of a building. It notices it sideways before it tries to go up, right? It's it's going to follow the light first, and then once that's no longer a concern, then gravity becomes the, the bigger concern. I think for the negative phototropism exhibited by roots, I I don't know if anyone's done this experiment, but my guess would be that the gravity, uh, the gravitropism would win over the phototropism, like. Um, there's no, I guess you could put like a light at the bottom of a plate directionally and then in, in a clear media and have a plant either have that gravity stimulus there or not, or the gravity stimulus in a different direction and see how that works. But that would be my guess for the roots. All right, so um, you guys are probably all familiar with sunflowers tracking the sun. I think this is really cool. So a colleague of mine took this um, video of a sunflower over the course of a day. And you can see the sun, the, to the right is the east, and to the left is the west. And not only is um, the plant moving that direction, but it positions the blades of the leaf to optimize sunlight capture. And then you can see it's dark right now. The sun has not yet risen. And that plant is already positioning itself to be ready for the next day, right? So sunflowers definitely track the sun through phototropism, but they also are keeping track of the time using an internal circadian clock so that they know exactly when they should optimize moving their leaves in position to the other side to be prepared for the next day of light. So I think that's really cool that in addition to just blindly responding to stimuli, plants actually can keep um, through the circadian clock a memory of the stimuli, not only the timing of it, but the directionality of that stimuli. So it's a lot more sophisticated than you might think when you're just eating the salad off of your plate. Um, in addition, plants a lot of plants can tell the difference between night and day. You probably notice some plants that at night, they don't bother to use the energy to keep the leaves up. They'll drop them at night. So these are just time-lapse videos of a plant um, putting their leaves up during the day and dropping them at night. Um, here's an example of gravitropism. So this is Arabidopsis. Um, and the pot is being turned on its side, and you can see very quickly those stems bend on this side 
to grow upward. Um, and in a little bit, I'll talk to you about the mechanism of how you can get an organ and a um, to bend when you have cells that can't move. Right? Um, there's a very specific mechanism that plants use. Um, and I also told you that plants can respond to touch. So here are some morning glory vines. They're winging around, trying to find something to climb up, and they're going to know that they found something to climb up because when they touch it, they're going to be able to sense that and then change their behavior to compensate for that. So you can see that this vine right here down this post, this guy's about to find that post. There he goes. And then um, the behavior changes slightly in response to that touch. In addition to this type of thing where plants can feel what they're touching, um, if you touch a plant, like I'm not even lying, a colleague of mine when I was at Rice University, this is what her lab did where the students had to go and like rub their hands over their plants like twice a day as a part of their research. Right, and what would happen is the entire uh, morphology of the plants would change and respond to that twice a day touching. So not only can plants sense when they're touching something else, but they themselves can sense when they're being touched and change their growth and response. Um, fortunately, the lab later found out that if you take a, a fan, a, um, like a box fan, and blow it on your plants, it does the same thing as like going in and touching it. So um, the students didn't have to go in and stand there for 10 minutes petting their plants. <laughs> you know, I would walk in and watch them doing this and just shake my head. Um, so it's a little less awkward than to blow a fan on your plants than to stand there and just like run your fingers over them. Any questions about that? Nope. No. All right. Um, so I think this is pretty brilliant, and I don't I don't know the mechanism of this. I'm not sure how well it's understood, but many of you are familiar with the Venus flytrap, where the touch stimulates it, it closing. But how many of you knew that it wasn't just touch, but they can count how many times they're touched? So for many of them, a single touch is insufficient to stimulate them to close. They have to be touched between three and seven times on um, the receptive pairs to be able to stimulate that close. So I think it's probably a, um, an accumulation of some uh, biochemical reaction that's allowing for that, but, um, but I think it's pretty cool. All right, so I'm gonna just choose one of these, um, which is phototropism, to talk a little bit about the mechanism of how you can have this directional stimulus and then affect a growth change in an organism that's sessile. Okay, and this has actually been known for a really long time. So um, Charles Darwin and his son Francis uh, wrote a book called The Power of Movement in Plants back in the 1880s. And in that book, they described the movement of seedlings in response to unidirectional light. So um, took a seedling and expose it to directional light. So this just happened to be a grass seedling. So um, a, a single coleoptile or blade coming up. And then he found that if he cut off the very tip of the seedling and expose it to directional light, this bending no longer occurred. Likewise, if you put a little hat on the top of the seedling um, that would block the light, this bending no longer occurred. So this was really interesting to him because the, that suggested that the light was being perceived here somewhere in the tip of the plant. However, the bending response was happening distal to that site. So it was happening lower down. So this led him to speculate that um, the tip of the plant was perceiving this directional light and somehow producing a mobile signal that moved down here to tell this part of the plant to bend. Okay, and this was built on later by um, other researchers that found. Is there a question? No. 
No question. No, okay. I thought I heard a question. So um, this is built on later by a group that put a little mica sheet um, that disrupted the tissue either on one side or the other side of the seed lane. And only if you disrupted the tissue on the side away from the directional light would you disrupt this bending response. Okay. So the way that this bending response even occurs down here is that you get differential growth on either side of this organ. So if you have a seedling that's growing up, can you guys see my arms okay? Yes. In addition to not being able to see you, I can't see myself on the screen, so I can't tell it. <laughs> Um, so if you have, if you have um, a ceiling that's growing up like this, and everything, all of your cells are cemented in place, so you can't move anything, how do you get the organ to move? So the way that plants do this is they'll have differential cell expansion on one side of the organ and not the other. So if you expand the cells on this side, you can imagine that that's providing enough force to shift the whole organ in one direction, right? Depending on which side you're expanding those cells. And so that's precisely what's happening here. If you look at cell lengths on either side of this organ, if you look here, these cells get more expanded. These cells are not expanding, and that's um, resulting in a net bend of the organ overall. Um, so then all of this led to another group uh, cutting off the tip of the seedling, putting a little sheet of gelatin here, putting the cap back on, doing the assay. They found that their um, curvature still happened, so whatever the signal was, it had to be um, aqueous and mobile through this little piece of gelatin, so that allowed them to then take this piece of gelatin and then uh, fractionate it and find out what compounds were in there, eventually leading to the discovery of this lovely compound called acid or auxin. So auxin comes from the Greek word to grow. Um, it's the first plant hormone discovered and um, it is what is driving both cell division and cell expansion events in plants. It also happens to be the hormone that my lab works on. So I think it's the most important. Um, so the way that this works is auxin is what's causing this photostimulation. And so um, when there's a directional light, the cells on this side um, of the stem elongate to cause this bend. And so um, the Claude and Wendt theory that was developed in the 20s is that in response to unilateral light, auxin produced at the tip of the seedling is transported laterally to the shaded side of the seedling to allow for this directional growth. And so um, it wasn't until the early 2000s that um, this model was actually shown to be correct. So it turns out to be auxin that's transported from the tip of this elongation zone only on one side, and then it stimulates growth on this, this side of the seedling. So um, this reporter, this blue that you're seeing is actually a reporter that um, is similar to um, to the lac reporter using microbes, but it's um, slightly different for plants. And it's every place reporter is active, you get a blue precipitate after staining. So all of this blue is showing you where the auxin transcriptional activation is happening. So auxin levels are really carefully regulated by, by biosynthesis and degradation, but transport and sequestration within cellular compartments is also really important. So I'm going to just briefly, briefly touch upon the mechanism of this because I think it's pretty cool and, again, illustrates the sessile nature of plants. If you have a compound that you're trying to um, accumulate only in one part of the seedling, so, for example, that part of the hypocotyl away from the light, but the compound is being made up here in the tip, how do you do that? So the way that plants do that is you have all of these cells embedded in the matrix of the cell wall, and you have your auxin, and that gets deflexed directionally out of this cell, and then it's taken up by another set of transporters into the neighboring cell here, 
and then it diffuses through this individual cell. And then there's another set of directional transporters in this case of the cell. It's only going to pump it in one direction. And this gets taken up by the next cell. And um, by a combination of effluxing um, this compound directionally, only from one um, from transporters localized to only one face of the cell, to getting it sucked up by the neighboring cells reiteratively results in the net flow of the compound in a way that can actually be fairly precisely controlled. Um, so since there's no circulatory system, this is how plants establish, um, they, they move compounds and they can also establish gradients of compounds by doing this. Um, very same mechanism um, using oxen and directional transport is used for um, gravity, gravistimulus and roots and also in shoots. Um, and that's pretty much how changes in growth in response to directional stimulus happens in plants. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Lucia, um, do you guys have any questions about that? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So how do the cells- um, Of course. How do the cells expand? Is it that they take on water or do they actually you know, add cytoplasm? And particularly when you have the cell, you know, bending in different directions during the day, what what is happening to those expanded cells as sort of the bending changes? Right. So, um, so I'll answer your first question first about how do the cells expand. Um, and we've known how cells expand in plants for a long time, but how auxin regulates this has only recently been identified. So, um, so auxin, it turns out, um, Changes some of the cellular components so that the there's a set of AAA ATPase proton pumps that are um, upregulated. <coughs> so that causes polar hyperpolarization of um, of this membrane here, and um, that turns on a bunch of potassium pumps that then causes potassium to be pumped. In into the cell and then of course water is going to follow so um, if you remember from Ram's lecture on Monday um, the, the directionality of um, that growth is largely dictated by uh, the, the matrix of the cell wall and the cellulose fibrils right so that's how cell expansion happens um, generally does that answer your first question sufficiently yes okay so then the next question is, so how do you get like sunflower, for example, where you have bending in this direction and bending in this direction and bending in this direction, right? Because once you've expanded your cells, you can't go back. The cells are expanded. So how do you do that? Um, and the answer is also, it's also an oxygen mediated process and um, you're using a distinct set of cells each day. So as the sunflower continues to grow upward, there's those newer cells that haven't expanded yet are going to differentially expand on either side each and every day. And that's also happening in the individual leaves. So there's quite a long um, leaf stem that it's going to use a different part of it sequentially every day to do that. So the bending is not happening in the same site every day. The bending is happening um, higher and higher up the plant on a daily basis. So bending is necessarily linked to growth. Or bending, you can get growth without bending, but you can't bend without growth. Okay. Okay, so there are a few key take home messages I want you to get from today. One is um, the sessile nature of plants and also of plant cells requires really unique mechanisms to regulate their growth and development. Um, plant cells also have flexible fates and display extensive post-embryonic development, which is really key for them to be able to um, respond to a changing environment. Um, and they use all of these different developmental processes to cope with their environment, amongst other processes like producing anti-nutritive compounds in response to uh, predation. And then um, plant hormones are really critical for response to this stimuli. So I gave you um, two examples of 
um, mechanical stimuli where plant hormones are involved. One is um, the predation of plants by insects, um, and another is uh, the like gravity perception and how plants respond to that by altering auxin to allow for directional growth. So do you guys have any questions? I have one question. Um, going back to the sunflower, uh, is, without like going into too many details, is that like driven by a chemical process, the time clock of them being able to move their leaves and such? The, going back to the sunflower example? Yeah, how they have like that internal clock over the course of yeah. and they're able to track time basically. So is that, I assume, driven by some chemical process or? Yeah, so there's a whole, um, there, it's actually a fairly complex circuitry of, uh, of processes that involve protein degradation and phosphorylation events um, that it's very similar um, in some regards to the circadian clock and metazoans. Um, and some of the components might, might be shared as well. Um, but yeah, it's um, protein degradation phosphorylation and um, the outputs from those, a lot of this, the things that are being regulated in the main clock are transcription factors. And so those that have transcriptional outputs that change over the course of the day as well. So it's pretty, com pretty complicated. Thank you.